So what we're going to do is compare SN2 and SN1 reactions with respect to steric hindrance. So the question is, how much steric hindrance is too much? How do we know when the steric hindrance causes the reaction to switch from SN1 to SN2 or SN2 to SN1? So in this first reaction, we just have a secondary halide because it's on a secondary carbon. And we have a strong nucleophile, a sulfur with a negative charge. Now I specifically picked sulfur with a negative charge because this is actually a weak base. So we won't be considering any E2 or E1 reactions. So if we just consider this reaction, it'll just be a regular backside reaction where the sulfur will attack from the backside and replace the bromine. So we'll just end up with this product where the sulfur is on the back with its carbon group. Now in this second reaction, we have a basic SN1 reaction. Why do we know? Well, we have a tertiary halide. It's on the connected to three carbons, and we have a weak nucleophile. This is OH, there's no negative charge, and it's happy the way it is, so it's not really that strong. So if any reaction were to happen, bromine would first have to leave, and then we'd have to form a carbocation, and then only then could this attack and show up. So we'd get our product to look like this, with just the OH, it would be a tertiary alcohol. Now what about this third one? So this one is interesting. So we have our tertiary carbon right here, but we have a strong nucleophile. So what it, which is it? Is it SN2 because of our strong nucleophile or is it SN1 because of our tertiary halide? Well, let's see if we can even make it do SN2. If we were to do SN2, this sulfur would have to come from the backside attack and attack this carbon. But look, we have three carbon groups next to it. So there's too much steric hindrance. So this wouldn't even happen. So what would have to happen is bromine to leave so that we can form a carbocation right here. Only then could sulfur attack from this side or from the bottom side because this actually becomes sp2. So just to redraw this and you can see what it looks like, you'll have, just to show some perspective, this will be an sp2 linear or planar molecule. So when sulfur attacks with its three lone pairs, it can either come from the top or come from the bottom. So there's no such thing as inversion, like in your regular SN2 reaction. SN1 can come from either side, because once you have a carbocation, it becomes planar. So our final product does look something like this, where you just have your tertiary carbon and you have your sulfur group. So what did we just show with this last reaction? What we showed is that the strength of the nucleophile has no effect on an SN1 reaction. The SN1 reaction is only affected by the substrate. If you have a tertiary carbon like this, it will be SN1, rea SN1 reaction no matter what. So what we just said is that steric hindrance takes priority. If, if steric hindrance prevents an SN2 reaction, then it's the most definitely going to be an SN1 as long as we don't have a strong base or a, as long as we don't have a strong base. So what about this reaction? Well, now we have a cyclohexane and we have a strong nucleophile right here. Now, is there much steric hindrance? Well, there's not all that much, but we want to look at the conformation to see what is the best way for the sulfur to attack. So if we look at the cyclohexane like this, where we have our bromine equ equatorial, which is usually more stable, we have these hydrons that are axial and this one as well. And if we wanted the sulfur group to do a backside attack, how would that look like? Well, this sulfur would have to come through here. Well, guess what? All of this area is an electron cloud. So there's a lot of steric hindrance for it to go through here. Now, it, because it has to go through the middle of the molecule. Now, if we had the chair conformation like this, where the bromine is actually down, and these hydrons are also equatorial, and we have some that are axial, the sulfur, if it were come to attack with a negative charge, it can come from a backside attack over here. Now, if you look here, it doesn't have to go through the middle of the molecule in order to do it. So what we just showed is that axial conformations is good for SN2 reactions. And it's the same thing with E2 reactions, but we're not considering them in this situation. So what would our product look like? Well, in this situation, our product would just be our cyclohexane with the sulfur group basically coming from a backside attack. And here, stereochemistry does not matter because it's not a chiral carbon anyways. It's a mesostructure. So what about this next one? 
Well, we still have our strong nucleophile, right? But we have a tertiary carbon. So, just like our previous example, sulfur could not attack. And let's see what the chair conformation looks like. If we had, if we drew it out, we have our bromine here, right? The axial way, like we wanted to. But we have a carbon group here, a carbon group here, and a carbon group here. And don't forget those axial hydrogens. So, this right here is tertiary. So it's really hard for sulfur to even come in through here, this negative charge, as well as this carbon, and come from the, do a backside attack. It's just too hard. There's too much steric hindrance. So we can't do an SN2 reaction. So the only option for us is an SN1 reaction, and our product would look like this, where we have our, still our cyclohexane, our methyl group, and our sulfur group. So that's what it would look like. Remember, we have to form a carbocation first for this to happen. Now, be careful, because we can have rearrangements, rearrangements when we do SN1. Here, in this case, we didn't have a rearrangement because we had a tertiary carbocation, and that's the most stable out of this entire molecule. But what if you don't have that? And how do you know whether steric hindrance is too much? Well, in this case scenario, it looks like you have a secondary carbon here. This one looks like a secondary one. So you're like, all right, I can do SN2 just fine. But hold up. Look at, let's look at the chair conformation for a second and see what that even looks like. If we draw it out, we have a carbon group here, a carbon group here, and then we have our hydrogen and then our bromine. Now you could say like, oh, well, SN, the sulfur group can just come and attack from the backside. But look at this. These two carbon groups will get in the way. You're going to have some steric hindrance over here that's going to prevent the sulfur group from coming down. Having one tertiary carbon next to a secondary carbon for bromine is enough to make the reaction favorable for E2. But we don't, and this is not even a strong base. So having two tertiary carbons next to a bromine like this is more than enough to prevent this from being an SN2 reaction, especially because of the steric hindrance. So what has to happen? Well, what has to happen is that we have to form a carbocation. So this has to leave, and we end up having this group right here. Now remember, what happens when we get a carbocation is that our molecule becomes, or not our molecule, but our atom becomes planar, right? So then, if we have our sulfur group with its lone pairs, it can attack from the bottom side or from the top side. Now, wait a minute. This is a secondary carbocation. Couldn't we have rearrangements? Well, of course we can. Remember, there's a hydrogen right there. And that can move over here. So what we would end up having is actually this molecule. So let's redraw that. And you have your two hydrogens over here. You have your axial methyl, and you have your carbocation. And this molecule right now, and this atom right here, is planar. We have our carbon group right there. Our sulfur group now can attack from either this side or from the other side. So you end up getting up to two products. You can get your first one, which looks something like this, where we'll redraw it how we had it with the perspective, where we have our methyl up and our sulfur, sulfur group down because it attacks from one side and this other methyl is not affected. Or we could have the other product where the sulfur attacks from the other side. So we have our methyl down and our sulfur group up and this other methyl is not affected so it's still up. So that's what that looks like. Now in this last example I wanted to show you, we have an oxygen with a negative charge. Now what's the difference? The well, difference is that this is a strong base. So if it's a strong base, we can possibly do E2. But that's one more thing you have to consider. If this bromine is going to be axial, remember in this situation, these carbons were axial as well. That means the only available hydrants for E2 were going to be equatorial. One that was over here and another that was over there. So we can't do, I'm just going to write this down. We can't do SN2 or do, I mean E2, because no diaxyl hydrants. So you have to remember that you have to have diaxyl hydrants for this reaction. So are you going to have SN2? Well, no, because in the same scenario over here, we still had a bunch of steric hindrance, so there's no way we can do it. So this will be, so this will be an SN1 reaction, just like in this scenario over here. So our products will be the same two where we had the methyl up, oxygen down, let me draw the dashed, 
and this other methyl up plus other plus the other product because of it's an, because SN1 does not have an inversion it can come from either side so what did we cover today well we covered that when steric hindrance becomes too much for when steric hindrance becomes too much for a strong nucleophile to do a SN2 reaction and when it's not possible to do an elimination reaction you will most definitely get an SN1 reaction so it doesn't matter if you have a strong nucleophile because we might think that we need a weak nucleophile in order to do SN1 but that's not the case the case is that we have steric hindrance and if we can't do elimination and there's steric hindrance then we must do SN1